So I would like to welcome everyone uh, to our third event in the series organized by the SOAS uh, uh, Library Decolonizing Working Group, um, specifically made up by myself. My name is Angelica Basquiera. Um, and um, uh, my colleague uh, Farzana Qureshi, um, Ludi Price, and Amapoku. Uh, we uh, initiated uh, this series uh, of events uh, and we called it the Hidden History, uh, precisely because we seek to highlight stories, um, hidden stories, stories that are not uh, um, so much into the mainstream or um, you know, so much known, uh, that's why we, we sort of call it hidden histories. Uh, and they seek to align stories from Africa, Caribbean, and Asian community in the UK and beyond, and bring into light a shared vision of the decolonize, colonizing knowledge production and documenting the unique voices and experiences of diasporas in Britain and across the world. Uh, that is the aim of the series, uh, and as I said, and uh, today we are very pleased to um, to open our third event, and uh, we are very very grateful um, to be able to host uh, um, our speaker today from the collective of uh, Black Iranians, um, uh, and the title of the event tonight is uh, Ziad Zibas, which is um, in Iranian. Sorry, I probably mispronounced it completely. <laughs> I don't speak. Um, uh, Iranian, and it means that black is beautiful. Um, therefore, uh, the, the collective invites you tonight uh, for a conversation about the importance of language in identity formation and in seeing ourselves. Um, I will not um, say too much about the collective because uh, my, we, we have in um, here tonight also our chairs uh, from the Center of African Studies, the Center for Iranian Studies, they were going to say more about the collective, but just um, uh, if you were to say that is a very uh, interesting, creative and critically conscious initiative uh, proposing an Iranian culture to stand fully at its Black and Africa intersections. Um, I don't want to, so yeah, I would like to say more, but <laughs> we have, as I said, a very packed evening. And so I will now uh, pass it on to my colleagues um, uh, uh, from SOAS. As I said, from the SOAS Center of African Study, we are very pleased to welcome Dr. Ida Giovannis. Uh, she's the head of the Africa section um, of the Faculty of Languages, Cultures and Linguistics. And um, uh, Dr. Fazad, um, Narges Fazad, who is a lecturer in, um, in uh, uh, Iranian studies, uh, Persian literature, and also she is the chair of the Center for Iranian Studies that, as I said today, together with the Center of African Studies, is hosting this event um, as part of the Hidden History series of the SOAS Decolonizing Working Group. I hope I, I, I said everything that um, I haven't, you know, forgot to mention something, but if I did, please uh, correct me. Uh, just one housekeeping uh, information. Um, uh, uh, basically, you will be, um, as an attendee, you can post your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, not in the chat. The chat is not in, the chat is disabled. So we would like you to put all your uh, uh, questions, comments, um, any you know things you like to say to the panelists in the Q and A chat. And the chairs at the end of the presentation uh, will pick the questions and hopefully we'll be able to answer as many as we can. But as you know, with Zoom and with the time constraint, we probably won't be able to go over all of the questions. You can always email them to us afterwards and, um, and, and stay in touch with us uh, um, as well in that way. Uh, ah, finally, to mention just the next event coming up in the series, um, my colleague Ludi, uh, can actually remind me the date, um, Ludi, sorry, I should know. <laughs> I think it's the uh, 23rd of January. 22nd. 22nd, excuse me. 22nd of January. So please watch the space. Uh, we have True Heart Theatre uh, coming, uh, is um, a Chinese theatre production company. And um, so it's a Chinese diaspora 
and that will be the next um, event in the series. So please keep following us and uh, keep engaging with, with us uh, through this series, which has proven so far to be extremely important uh, and has created a really interesting debate and conversation that we really hope we can take forward uh, as we proceed with the different events and, um, and different conversation. Uh, but for now, we are so, so pleased. I just can't tell you how happy I am to be able to welcome uh, the collective for, for Black Iranians, uh, outstanding, incredible, uh, um, incredible group. So welcome again. And I will now pass it on to Ida. Dr. Ida Giovayan is our first chair of tonight's um, event. And Ida from the Center of African Studies is going to say a few words of welcome. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you very much, um, Angelica. That was uh, fantastic. Uh, I'll just speak for one minute just to introduce myself. So um, first of all, everybody, welcome to Sia Zibast. I hope I said that okay. I probably got it all wrong as well. Black is Beautiful, which is organized by Hidden Histories. Again, Farzana, Angelica, thank you so much for doing these events. They're just uh, really amazing. So I am Ida Hajivayanes, and I am lecturer of Swahili Studies here at SOAS. And I'm here to represent um, so SOA Center for African Studies. And uh, it's really amazing to have this kind of cross-regional events like we have today. Um, so which are looking at blackness and Iran and Africa. Um, I'm originally from Zanzibar in East Africa. And we have a huge community there of what we call the Washirazi. And the Washirazi are people who came from Iran and settled. And we have so many myths. And, and realities about the Shirazi. So today is really exciting for me in that I might be able to sort of like um, learn a lot about my own people uh, by being here. I don't want to take too much time, but I just wanted to, to, to flag up something. We have a new degree, which is BA Africa and Black Diaspora, which kicks off uh, September this year. And this will be the kind of uh, sort of like subject and discussions that we will have in that uh, degree. So please look it up. And um, um, I will now pass the button to my colleague Narges Farzad, who will say a bit more about um, her, her region. Thank you very much. Thank you, Idar John. Salam wa khush amadid. A warm welcome to all our panelists and to all our um, audience. Um, uh, dear Angelica, there is a um, in a message, someone has requested whether we can enable the transcript. I think they need it for, I don't know whether, I don't want to interfere with any setup here. So that was a little bit of a by the by. Um, my name is Nargis Farzad and I um, look after matters Persian studies in terms of language and literature at SOAS. I also co-convened the MA Iranian studies and wear another hat, which is the chair of Iranian studies. And this is such an amazing event. I am delighted to be invited to participate in this because um, for a while I have been following um, a couple of the participants here on their Instagram uh, webpage. And it's such an amazing bonus to actually be able to have them join us. The topic is extraordinary in so many ways because there are as so many Iranians of my generation would not really ever think about the um, you know, presence of a black diaspora in Iran. And maybe because Iran is incredibly tribal, if you like, you know, we have the Kurds that are Kurdistan or, um, you know, Baluchis in Baluchistan, and we think of Boucher, we never, certainly when I was growing up, you, you just adjust, you adjust to the music, to the beats in the city, to the clothing, to the physical features, etc. But of course, you know, coming to UK, then I learned so much more thinking there are, there are so many layers of this history and you 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 sort of rather warily 
with the trepidation, hold a mirror to yourself, to your culture, to your history, to all the things that you perhaps so wrongfully boasted about, of being inclusive, being believing equality and, um, uh, you know, uh, openness to every human being. And you realize that actually quite a few miles away from the truth. So I am delighted to, on behalf of uh, SOAS, along with my colleague, Ida, to uh, welcome this amazing group, the representatives of uh, Collective for Black Iranians, and with the Siyah uh, Zibost, Black is Beautiful, uh, who will be uh, taking us on uh, this amazing um, chapter of our history, I imagine. I don't want to guess what you will say, and I won't introduce you. I don't want to take a minute more of your time than necessary. So please, I don't know, shall I start by inviting Priscilla first to take the lead on the um, next stage? Hello. Thank you so much for having us. I'm just first checking that everyone can hear me okay. And we can. everyone can see the presentation okay as it will hopefully be taking on the entire screen. Okay, wonderful. Well, good evening, everyone. Salam Hamegi, Khayli, Khoshumadin. You're so welcome, wherever you are joining us from. It's an honor to be here tonight. Thank you so much for inviting us. Thank you for thinking of the work of the collective when you think of Iran. My name is Priscilla Kunkuhoveda and I'm the founder of The Collective. I'm also a human rights uh, jurist and a filmmaker. I live in Freetown, Sierra Leone in West Africa. And uh, I'm really delighted to be in the presence of two of the co-founders, Pardis and Alex Eskandarjo and Pardis and Koy who are joining us from Canada uh, and the United States, as well as our resident uh, historian, Bito Barulizadeh, as well as our resident artists, Gelore and Sahar and Pego Bahadori joining us from Iran, Tehran. So it's a transnational team at the image of our identities, um, whether it is on the African side of our intersection, our blackness or our Iranian identity. Um, for me, Siyazi Bost, meaning black is beautiful in Persian, has always been words that I needed to say. I was born in France and raised in Tehran by my Iranian mother and family. And I spent my time between Tehran, Isfahan, Mashhad, Shomal, and pretty much central and northern of Iran. Like a lot of Iranians joining us tonight, I have memories of drives up north, memories of spending summers in Isfahan, where my grandfather is from, and memories of going to school in Tehran. Uh, the only difference being that I'm also black, as well as African and Iranian. So I came with all my differences and I always felt the need within the Iranian community, my community, and within all its diasporic iterations, the need, the urgent need to say Siyazibost, Black is beautiful. And it is through that, that the collective with others like Pardis, Pariso, Pego, Sahar, some Black, some not Black, some Black Iranians, some Africans, some Iranians who also felt that similar need and why? Well, because if you think of the question of race and blackness in my community, I mean, the portion that's Iranian of it, that's what it looks like, absence of conversation, silences, hushes. And truly, whatever we want to do or say, as you can all see on the slide, we are here, right? You can see, for those who follow the work of the collective Khizron, at the bottom left of the slide, hopefully. And we were always here, Black folks in the Iranian community, fully part of the community. And that's what we're going to discover this evening or rediscover ourselves for a lot of us. And, you know, truth is for us, Black and Iranians, Midunin, it was never an absence. It was never a silence because we all, I always had the reflection of myself and you'll hear from other of us, from, from the collective, some of us come from families who are Afro-Iranians, uh, unlike me, who come from part African and part Iranian. But all of us share in common having heard words, reactions to the color of our skin. In Persian, they're written here for the Farsi Zabon who are here and can read it. The most common one being Siyah, which is black. 
and it takes us to the importance of language and what happens when we are in a space that's void and the only words that we hear are words that actually keep repeating, you know, the color of our skin, but within a context that doesn't necessarily recognize the fullness of who we are. So it's words like siyor being, you know, called out on the streets my entire childhood in Tehran, as well as while navigating the Iranian diaspora. I have quite a bit of anecdotes in the Iranian British diaspora in London, as it's quite relevant, and also of being hushed when wanting to say siyor zibost, of being told, what is black? We don't have black and white. This is all importations from the West. You are bringing this from America. I am not American, just so you know, even though I speak um, English, <laughs> like many of us on the panel tonight. And, you know, it's in this cacophony of words, you know, of asking us, but why are you black? Is it because of the sun? I was asked my pretty much my entire childhood, but also as an adult woman when going to the south of Iran and finally discovering, you know, the Afro-Iranian communities of the south also being called out in Boucher, Siyah, in Bandar Abbas, Siyah, by non-black folks, and realizing with others this important need to add Zibos at the end. And as we like it at the collective, we will play you one of the very first, um, one of the not very first, but one of the many uh, visual productions that uh, we're so uh, privileged to do in collaboration with many artists from the community, from the diaspora and beyond, sitting at the intersection or not. And let's just listen to this very short snippet. <laughs> Sahar, please, if you want to jump in. Hi, uh, yes. Um, can everyone hear my voice? Is that okay? Yes, we can. Perfect. Um, so this piece um, is very important and um, the whole process of making it was very important because whilst I don't experience the community the same way, I think Paddy's, Paddy, so Pega and Presidia and so on do, um, I've always felt this. I always seen the flags, if that makes sense, um, from the community. And it was like talking to people within the community back home or here that you would kind of see those flags, especially when I would describe stories um, with my closest friends who are black and see their responses and be very anti-black in the comments they would make. So um, it was that, you know, those things that I experienced, I was like, okay, there's a problem here. There, there, there's something, there's a lot of education that needs to be done. Um, so it's, it's a, so interesting to see and so powerful to see this, these stories come to life visually as well, because it's one thing to feel it, like for, my, for myself, for example, when speaking to people back home or here and seeing it visually come to life, it's very powerful and it um, has made, I think, it's started, CLZ bus is starting to make a massive impact. So, and I think just in general, CLZ bus and creating it was very, very powerful. And you can also find Many of the visual representations of Black is Beautiful, CLZ Boss, brought by the talented Sahar Horishi, who just spoke now, who's also Iranian. And she didn't talk about herself, so I'm going to make sure we know, who's <laughs> also <laughs> Iranian um, from Central and the South, uh, uh, one of the resident artists at the collective, who spent a lot of time listening to our stories and our experiences. And it's through this creative collaboration that we bring our stories of belonging our stories of being, um, standing at this intersection of being black and Iranian. Pardis, if you want to take it over. Hello, um, Sanam. My name is Pardis Mpoye. Um, I am a native, um, born and raised in Salt Lake City, Utah. I'm now living in Brooklyn, New York. I'm one of the five co-founders of The Collective. And to give you a little bit of background on who we are, we are a group of uh, artists and activists and storytellers. And really, you know, The Collective was born out of necessity and, and actually a lot of frustration um, because there was a lack of seeing and hearing our voices. 
um, in the stories that we hear about Iran. Uh, so the collective brings for the first time really, uh, you know, voices, our voices of black and Afro-Iranians from uh, Iran and the Iranian diaspora, whether it's, you know, in Iran or Canada or the US where I'm at, um, Germany, the UK, we're all over the place. And our goal is to really make sure that the conversations around blackness are held within the Iranian diaspora. These stories of, of Black and Afro-Iranians need to be told from our perspective um, and told from, from everybody worldwide. We really want to make sure that conversations around race, around Blackness, and who we are are really expanded and you know, allow room for every point of view, diverse points of views and narratives, including ours. Thank you. Um, so uh, the collective is a creative and critically conscious initiative proposing an Iranian culture that stands at its Black and African intersections. Um, my name is Pega. I'm from Mina Bandar Abbas. It's a city located just above Persian Gulf. And um, I'm connecting tonight from Tehran, Iran. Um, so what we do in the collective is that we create space, language, and we unearth histories that we will discover together later in the series. And um, we just want to share some light um, on the fact that we exist and our history and our original stories and what are the things that um, we all have to say tonight. Alex John. Hello, everybody. My name is Alex Eskanakha. I'm uh, tuning in from Canada, and uh, I'm one of the six co-founders. Uh, here over at The Collective, our approach is grounded in African history and wisdom. Uh, we use you know, African literature. We turn to African literature, thought leadership from not just Africa, but around the world, from the Black African diaspora, the US, you know, from like, France Fanon. Um, this piece here is from Chuma Achebe. Um, and it says, until the lions have their own historians, the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. And this is a, a theme that I think has become much more common in the last two years, really about you know, what perspectives are we getting history from. Uh, this art piece here was made by the collective in collaboration with China Dumas, uh, a Black American artist in the US. And uh, the one on the bottom right is with artist Kimia Fatih, an American, uh, American Iranian, an Iranian American artist based in the US. <clears throat> so in our approach to create our space and take our space uh, and say see us the boss, we do that through collaboration. Um, hi everyone. A lot of the work of the collective um, addresses the sort of um, erasures that have excluded and denied and rejected Black Iranian histories. Um, and actually there are, as old as we have references to Iran, we have references to Black Iranians as well. Um, and so this is just a map, it's a 10th century map um, done by Astakhri. I, I teach it, I have printouts in front of me in my office right now. Um, but I love this map because it really shows how our understanding of the region uh, was so different historically. And the fact that we see Iran and, and Africa as so divorced from each other, as so far away from each other is really a, a reflection of um, worldviews and, and geographies that have really changed in the past few centuries. So um, if we could go to the next slide, I've labeled the, this map, it's a multi-directional map. And what it's done is it's compressed the Persian Gulf and the Indian Ocean into one sort of body of water so that Iran is actually facing East Africa, it's facing Zanzibar. Um, and it's, it's included on the same page, right? This is not something that we'd see usually in in a map of the Indian Ocean today, they're usually, you know, like uh, away from each other. Um, and this is the sort of world view that we are keeping in mind um, that this is a long history of exchange and not just migration, but also belonging on both coasts.
Figo, you want to start? Yes, thank you. Um, so a lot of us, we thought about why we're here and why we look the way we look. Um, the question is um, that for many of us, we think that why we're black. Is it because of the sun? Is it because um, we stayed in the sun too long? And of course, we don't believe it's because of the sun. But believe me when I tell you that a lot um, of the people around us, a lot of our family members, people we meet every day on the streets, they believe we're Black because we stayed in the sun for too long. And of course, this is not the story. Yeah. And I think, Pego John, what you're pointing towards with the sun is, is also one of the direct impacts of the absence of dialogue, right? Um, of the absence of conversation is that it gives room to so much ignorance. And when it comes to, you know, uh, our job and question, our community and questions of race and blackness, this is where we stand in, in complete ignorance because of this absence of language. And yet these two pieces that you see, um, one is produced by the collective with resident artist Mina uh, Jafari, as you can see, and the other one is a photograph. Um, and uh, Obviously, we're not always keen to show visual representation of um, our ancestors standing at the intersection because sometimes, unfortunately, it is the portrayal of um, situations of enslavement, like on this particular photograph. But because we're in this, in this, uh, as uh, the work of Vita Barulizade, who's also assistant professor at Bucknell, has shown, is the erasure of of uh, of of. Uh, the, 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 the effort of the abolition, abolition of, uh, of enslavement in Iran only in 1929. And what all that has caused through uh, the erasure of these uh, conversations. Um, and we really invite you to dig into the work of the collective, into the work of our resident historian and others to you know, find out more about what it is that was erased. But it led us in a, in a community, including in its diaspora, where race, in, that includes and conversations about race that includes blackness just don't exist, right? And yet you have the history of Hizron that exists. Um, this piece that you see here is actually telling the story of Nargis and Hojenone, but we also told the story who are also black women who were enslaved from Africa into Iran. So stories of migration uh, that are forced, but also stories of migration that are chosen, um, stories of belonging, of coming from Iran and already being being in Iran and being uh, Black as well. All these stories are the stories that we bring um, with the collective, of course, making them available in a format that's hopefully digestible for all, but always with the urgency of saying that we were there, we are here, and we will always be here, and that Sior Zibost, Black is beautiful. As we, uh, as we touched on at the beginning of the presentation, the collective was founded out of the necessity to see ourselves in Iranian history. And often that means having to rewrite ourselves into the history and put ourselves in focus. Um, Patrice, you wanna take it away? Yeah, I, I think, you know, the collective was really started because we saw this need. We saw a lack of our own stories and needed to rewrite the history. Um, you know, in, in Black history in all of the Iranian diaspora, including, you know, Iranian American and Iranian British community was lacking um, in Black stories. You can see in the photo on the left that, um, you know, there's, there's one man, uh, you know, uh, of color and we, we took this, we rewrote it and made the focus him. You know, this is really representative of what we do at the collective. You know, we want to make sure that discussions on the Iranian identity include blackness, uh, because blackness and Iranianness are not um, separable. Mm -hmm. And and also, what's perhaps interesting to note, you know, having navigated our diaspora as for all of us, is that we've seen this painting being shown. We've seen some of these photographs being described and discussed in academia in, in, in uh, by Iranian scholars, but never, never was there mention of uh, the eunuch present on the photo, the African eunuch present on the photo, meaning uh, a, a young black African boy who was enslaved from Africa by, in, in, dur during the time of, of enslavement, who was castrated and put into the harems to act as the eunuch, 
the guardian of the harem, taking care of the administrative affairs of the harem during Qajar era. How can we show this painting and ignore that history? And what does it feel when you're standing at this intersection like I am, like Pego is, like Candice is, like Alex is, like so many of us are, when you are in these spaces and it's never mentioned? In the same way that, um, you know, visual representation of Blackness is minimal or non-existent, um, the representation of Black folks in Iranian literature has also been almost exclusively from the pen of non-Black folks. And I say almost exclusively because uh, to leave a margin, anything is possible, you know, but most Iranians in and outside of Iran really don't uh, have the opportunity to read narratives about the Black Iranian experience the same way that we're raised in other aspects of Iranian consciousness, we're also raised in literature. So read with the collective, hashtag read with the collective is a series that we brought to introduce audiences to Black Iranian literature. Uh, these books feature writers that are Black Iranian, Afro-Iranian, African Iranian, uh, and we really showcase their work uh, to show narratives that give us agency through nuanced stories about us and for us. So last year we dove into uh, Nigerian British novelist Victoria Princewell's book, the pa In the Palace of Flowers. Uh, it's set in the Golestan Palace of the Qajar dynasty, dynasty in Iran. And it centers around the narrative of um, two enslaved peoples, uh, Jamila and Abilamek, who um, are African of African descent. And it's the first time that I personally have heard stories like the story of Jamila um, it's, a, it's an imagined story, but it's also inspired by historical events. Uh, it shows that Black people have been and are a part of, you know, the Iranian uh, history. Stories like this um, and the stories that we talked about earlier, like Khizran and Haji Nane and Nargis, these are, these are Black Iranian women whose stories um, are just not put in the center. So we center them at the collective uh, to make sure that they're no longer discarded or erased. Yeah, and then uh, we followed up that uh, that read with also seeing race, which is uh, Vita's dissertation to give context to, in the Palace of Flowers. And then we followed that up with a uh, black book uh, by Matteo Ascaripur, who pens the world of 22 year old Darren, AKA Buck, who begins working in white corporate America and becomes a token black guy at a tech startup. Um, it's a great book, fascinating read. And, you know, we produced some interviews with Mateo, whose father is Iranian and mother is Jamaican. You know, he speaks Farsi and stands at this intersection, uh, being a native of Brooklyn, New York. And um, at the collective, we want to show these stories from someone that looks like Mateo, you know, that looks like me, that looks like us at the collective, that people that look like us can think about and write about these experiences, whether they're in corporate America, whether they're in Iran, whether wherever they are. And what can we learn from them as a community that he is a part of, that he represents? Um, he's also working on his second novel. And in February, we will be hosting an event around Black Buck. And, and during the process, we try to make everything from the book available, whether there's excerpts, whether there's uh, free copies that we had given away in a contest over at our social media pages. And um, in this case, sometimes, you know, we translate it in Persian, which is pretty often. Gilar, you want to take it away? Sure. Hello, uh, my name is Gelare Khoshkozaran, and uh, along with my colleagues, Morishin Alahiri and Nimo Behravan, I've been uh, working with the collective to do the translation work and make sure that uh, the wonderful work that they're doing is also accessible to folks in Iran and the larger uh, Persian speaking community. Um, so, I mean, through the process, it was all around um, a learning process. It is still an, a learning process. So from the get-go, we decided to um, uh, start a glossary of, of words that either didn't have um, a common translation or um, revisiting some of the words that have been translated with a different lens and seeing you know, what would be the alternatives and how the interpretations and how the connotations would shift if we change one thing to another. So for instance, you know, one of the first words was to translate anti-Blackness, um, 
or revisiting words such as racist or racism that has been translated to uh, Nejad Parasti. And we thought that because it um, has such a strong um, kind of punch to it, Iranian community, you know, would, would need a more subtle verb of uh, a subtle word of understanding how racism is not exactly, you know, always in its extremist fo forms that have been identified in history. And, but looking more closely into how their biases are formed around uh, how different folks have been uh, racialized through history. So we shifted, for instance, the word, um, Sia, um, sorry, um, uh, Nejad Paras to Nejad, uh, Nejad Zade. So someone who's been, you know, who has biases against race more than someone who praises uh, a certain race, which is, you know, white supremacy. Um, and also the other challenges or some of the interesting questions were, uh, you know, there were videos and voices from home where, um, you know, there's a, there's a person who identifies as black and there's another person or, or their mother is not black. And we were thinking, you know, when, when we acknowledge um, black Iranians also how to not uh, feed this perpetual, you know, myth of whiteness of the rest of the Iranians, um, speaking of, you know, decolonization of the mind and uh, all these years and you know, centuries of uh, identifying more with the white, white race um, and how not to perpetuate that as well. Um, because believing that, you know, the more that we, we see closely, we, we, we realize how much closer we are to culturally to, to the cultures of Africa and black folks more than, you know, the white. Um, so, um, but also like what was interesting to me was growing, you know, being born and raised in Iran, you know, my introduction to a lot of, even, you know, as Priscilla mentioned, you know, there was either no language or if it existed, it was anti-Black. Um, but even the positive relations to Afri Africa in terms of the production of knowledge and culture through the global Black resistance movement in, in among the Iranian left, it was always thought of as this thing that existed elsewhere. And it was the plight of the Black folk um, that the left in Iran identified with. But it was less of... Um, seeing the how the two are converged and you know and seeing you know how it could be left and and black in iran um but there was no room for that kind of imagination it was always this kind of distant source of um solidarity and inspiration so you know being introduced to langston hughes or tony morrison or fanon you know those were folks that I was introduced to first in farsi or persian then in english but that connection was not quite made that there's also um, Black Iranians that could be part of the same worldview or struggle or thought. And the collective, uh, for me and people like me, made that connection. Mm, and I think, you know, we've language when uh, we've language that the in interesting experience also is how language is alive and how language can, can actually evolve and change and take into consideration new points of view or perhaps points of view that were overlooked, ignored, silenced. So how do we, it's not so much, if there is no language because there is an absence of conversation or because the only language available as we saw earlier um, in the presentation is either one that praises colorblindness, we don't have these things, these things are from somewhere far in uh, New York. Um, or, you know, language that's anti, and, you know, for a lot of us, colorblindness is anti-Blackness in many ways, um, because it erases who you are and your experiences, you know, it's very difficult to imagine, uh, you know, it's not so difficult because this is how I grew up, like, like Pega, like, I know many other Black Iranian kids, but to go through experiences as a child, um, and not have the language to say, the way this kid talks to me, uh, it was not just making fun of the way I look because I looked that way, it felt that it was a bit deeper. And I remember crystal clear having this conversation with my white Iranian mother, you know, and she would look at me and go, she had she had she tennis because in her reality, it didn't exist. Therefore, it probably didn't exist in her daughter's reality because we're so focused on saying that we're all the same that we erase people's differences because yes, we're all the same, but it's okay to have differences that you know we can create language on so that then we can be different and the same together. And that's what let's talk about 
blackness is about, you know, what happens when there are conversations about who we are instead of being silenced and ignoring it for whatever intellectual cowardice or dishonesty we're going through. And Pego, if you want to take it away for this one. You're muted. I think you're... Thank you, it's fixed. And um, yeah, people say Sia or Black to us when they see us um, somewhere. And it's the main thing that I've been called throughout my life. But when I look at myself and like I see myself, um, I see that I'm Sia and also Sabze, which means mixed and Iranian, of course, and um, Black, and Minabi, and Southern, um, from Southern parts of Iran, and women, and etc. And I'm a lot more than the word that um, people, people are um, calling me with most of the times. I mean, at least um, three times a day, I hear that um, when I'm walking down a random street in any city of Iran. Dariran, Dariran. And this is what's important, right? Is to, is to what happens when we um, break those silences and we share our experiences. What kind of point of views are we gonna form? Um, and so. Pego, go ahead. I see you already. <laughs> the family. Thank you. <laughs> This is what happens when we do that and when we break the silence um, and we try to talk about it and when we um, we have difficult conversations about our experiences and we through those conversations um, we can understand each other um, better because there's this lack of information there's this um, lack of understanding between us and other people they just view us as black they're like and they don't um, try to um, understand our grounds and what we think of of ourselves and so yeah we try to have these difficult conversations um, but it's working we can perhaps for some of you have seen some of these pieces but i think what's important is in our work at the collective we stay also very aware of our diasporic identities. We know very well what it means to be Iranian. Look at this panel, even from SOAS. Um, you know, we're from London, different African cities, Iran, the US. So in the same way, black African identities are also diasporic. So we bring, um, you know, the wealth of, of cinema, of literature that exists, that is Black, that is African from different parts of the world, whether it is with this piece by the incredible Usman Semben, a Senegalese filmmaker who's considered the, the, the I don't like to say the father of African cinema, but he's considered the, one of the main of the African cinema. And, uh, you know, we, we translate these pieces. Asan, I can be, uh, if you see the title of this, of this um, of this piece, it's Dr. Um, which, you know, I, I, just like Pego, I was called uh, out Sior all the time, every day, every day. And to this day, as, a, as, a, as an older woman who goes to Iran, whether it's the South or the North, I am still called out. So what is the story of Dr. Sior, who goes to, 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 to Paris in this particular uh, situation? What does the sound of um, a woman of African descent who lives in Capo Verde, um, what does she have to say in her story of belonging, of being Afro-Portuguese, of African descent, living in Capo Verde and sharing a narrative similar to, you know, that of uh, some of us on this panel and many others uh, in Iran and its diaspora. And so, you know, we keep saying, deal with it. It's a diverse, diverse world. Who wants to listen to Cesaria Evora? <laughs> <laughs>
beautiful piece and so many of us can relate. And uh, I can assure you, I, I do not speak um, Portuguese and I'm sure many of us don't, but can still relate to, to this piece. And that's still the power of language when, when we are seen. Oh, sorry, this is playing again. Oh, why not? <laughs> All right, which take us to voices from home. Sedoha as khone as vatan as tahe delemun. Truly, asan voran sedoha as tahe delemun. But we can't translate this into English. By the way, we do translations on both ends. And sometimes we're stuck. We don't find the English translation of tahe delemun. You're welcome for suggestions in the comments on that one. And this takes us to voices from home. And I'm so honored to start with Pegla's story, who's our resident storyteller at the collective, and brings a story of Minog of Bandar Abbas, of the South, of everywhere, and of ways of being Iranian that, uh, you know, should be centered, have to be centered, that we know we center at the collective. Let's listen to her. Adima, in sonnatoye, masan, sizda bedar o eidu ina ro khili nadoshtan, samitama. Vali, masan, har moghe ke eidu shode, yani, salo nomu shode, همه لباس تمیز می پوشیدن، یه غذای خاصی می پختن و می افتن به هم دیگه سر می زدن بعد حیوان ها رو می شستن به پیشونی گاوا خاک قرمز می زدن و یه سری کاری جالب می کنم به باقا شو رسیدگی می کردم می افتن بیون I'm realizing this version has a translation or doesn't? I couldn't see it um, But you can find the piece on all our socials, and it's the celebration. I mean, Pego, you're right here. I feel like you should be. Yeah, thank you. So um, one of our mottos at the collective is um, your experience is your expertise. And your experience is your expertise, is yours to tell, is yours to share and find eco in this world. So um, I will let you do that and listen to um, some of the pieces we made from the Voices from Home series. And we can travel from Bandar Boucher, um, to Canada, to Los Angeles, to Abadan, which is a city in the southern parts of Iran. And the point of this series is um, once again to say that we are here, um, not only through our Bandari entertainment, which is um, the music from the southern parts of Iran, um, or through our exotic backgrounds, as some people tell it, um, but through our stories and what we have to say. So let's listen to some of these pieces. ولی خب الان هم بهترین چیزیه که دارم واقعا دوستش دارم فکر کنم که خیلی خواستم و اینکه یه چیزی که اقلیت دارمش و به این خاطر دوستش دارم یه روز داشتم از مدرسه می اومدم با مامانم بودم یه پسر از تحت دلش بهم گفت سیا بعد خیلی بد گفت مامانم یه جور نگام که انگاه دلش برام سوخت ولی چون اون سفید بود حس میکردم نمیفهمه من چه حسی دارم پسر بچه بهم گفت که برو همون چون فکر میکرد که من کسی فهم بشوازی که اصلا این شکل نبود و این قلی من شکل بود ادعاتون اینه سابقه داری من ادعام اینه گاییدم سابقه کاریتون رو یا سکوتم کافیه واسه دل داری میمونگی خیلی ها تو فاصله داری نه من نمیترسم از علتون بلا نسبت نگفتم بخوره به همه تون درفم درسته چند وقت نبودم تو را ولی خبر سیده پای سرم زبون در اومده ها بگی بس کنن این جغله ها اینا که لیولشون این درد لیول ما اصلا چی میدونن از رب کردن من لیدرشون رو کردم تو رب کردن کف کردن اینا روی چند نفرم بیان من که تک نفرم تک نفرم دو بیان طرفم با تک لگدم از رو همون لفت قلمه که نگی بلده با قلمش کلمه پرد کنه از تو دهنش یا نگی بدون نیرو کمکی من نگرو هستم رفتاری 
سلام من نگرو هستم رپری در ساله از آبادان معنی لقبم هم یعنی کاکاسیا دیگه هم نیازی نیست کسی بخواد به تم از خوربه بگه کاکاسیا من خودم افتخار میکنم کسی ها بوستن بس همین همین از بارو خودم بزنشم خاطرات خیلی عجیب هستن شاید سی درصد ناراحتی بیاره ولی افتاد درصدش خوشحالیه یادم روزهای اول مدرسه به ما کتاب میدادن اما من دنبال توپ فوتبال بودم چون از ذهن قفل بودم بیشتر عاشق فوتبال بودم تا درس و تحصیل همچین چیز اشتباه ولی من همین بودم صدا میزدم پله میدونی <تصفح> افکارم این بود مثل پله تو سن 17 سالگی قهرمان جام جهانی بشم خب هر فوتبالی سیاه روزی همچین چیزی رو داره همیشه فکر میکردم هیچ سیاه نمیتونه به جز من تو فوتبال ایران موفق باشه تا اینکه یه روز جلال ما رو تو دفتر باشگاه شاهین جمع کرد که من تو اون تیم بازی میکردم رده جوانان همین که وارد دفتر باشگاه شدم محوی قاب عکس قدیمی شدم اون عکس مردی بود سیاپوس که دوم تو هوا بلند شده با تعجب از مربیمون پرسیدم این بازیکنه کیه؟ گفت این مروارید سیاه سحمد رزمی مروارید سیاه چیز با ارزشی هست و گرون که سیاده به خاطر دو هزار تا صدف شکار میکنن که یک دونه مروارید سیاه به دست بیارن به خودم گفتم چه لقه بی و از همون روز من دوست داشتم احمد رزمی باشم و صدام کنن مروارید سیاه دوست داشتم من نزدیک ببینمش ولی نبود چی را زندگی میکردم بعد چند سال موقعی که من سرباز تیپ پنج و پنج برد شدم در اون زمان من واسه آبورد فوتبال بازی میکردم که یه روز خود احمد رزمی اونجا حضور داشتم کنار مربی تیم ما اتفاق به این جذابی خوشحال کننده بود واسه من و باعث افتخار یه روز تو خونه نشسته بودم سعی کردم که خودمو دوست داشته باشم رفتم جلو آینه دیدم که واو من یه موی فر دارم یه پوست سبزه که خیلی دوست دارن جای من باشن شاید محیط اطرافم جوری باشه که همیشه حرف شنیده باشم راجع بشون ولی فهمیدم که من موی فر دارم پوست سبزه دارم قد خوب دارم هیکل خوب دارم و سعی کردم که افرادی دورم داشته باشم که اگه یه روز فراموش کردم که من زیبام یادآوری کنم و همین جور شد هر وقت که احساس ناتوانی می کردم این که از حرفای دیگران که به می گفتن زشت یا هر چیزی رو یادآور می کردم که من واقعا سیبام و هر فرد زیبایی خودشو داره و اینجوریه واقعا هر فرد زیبایی خودشو داره پس تو هر جوری که هستی زیبایی خودتو قبول داشته باشی سیاه همیشه زیباست یه روز تو خونه نشسته بودم سعی کردم که خودم رو دوست داشتم So these pieces are original pieces produced by the collective in collaboration with different voices We also present films that were made and that's the few films that are made and center black and afro-iranian stories in ways that you know, keeps their agencies چه قصر آباما مرچنش چور زدی؟ اما سیاه بودن آبا ما رو سفیدت نکرد فرج تو درست میگی سیاست زاد داره از هم ریشه داره گذشته از که آیندهش معلومه از بحث ما در همین نقطه به پایان میرسه ابرام داسه چکش باد برد گرباچاف همی الان بلش بکنی روز سبار میره کلیسا مذهب به تو نارمن آقای به تو نارمه کاردینال غنا و نیجریه شد پاپ بعدش چه میشه تاریخ بده کاریش به سیاه پس میده بعد میشیم یر به یر تو کجا یر به یر کجا سیکان این امونش هنو هیچی نشده شاق شدیم و اونا همچی چیزی نمیخوان بفهم شوخی کرم ابرام جونو خود شوخی کرم دل نگی چه قصر آبا ما مکه این شور زدی This is uh, from a film, because we're always asked, um, it's from a film named Pop, um, as you can see written in Farsi for those who can 
uh, reading Farsi, and we'll be happy to share um, any you know information on these pieces. Just to note that uh, the the, the Afro-Iranian gentleman is the father of Sara Farajzadeh, who's one of the resident storyteller and whose film we've watched um, earlier. <laughs> And this takes us to Sio Zibos, the very last um, segment of our presentation with you guys. And let's just play this piece produced by the collective with Sahar Gurishi, we're lucky enough to have with us tonight. And let's see who in the audience remembers um, this song. And please uh, let us know in the chat. I'm not reading it, but I'm hoping somebody will. <laughs> I could play it. Uh, I actually played a lot for my children, FYI. So uh, we uh, we have I have three little ones and they're obsessed with this. And it's the kind of visual representations, you know, that may seem like right? Meaning, what is this? It's just children sitting doing that. No, it's it's actually really powerful visual. It was my first time seeing the song with hands that look like mine when I was younger. It was my first time and I'm in my thirties and I know I'm not the only one. I know it's the reality for all of us. There is no visual representation of, of blackness that's positive, that's saying that we are here, that we're a part of the community. When conversations about blackness in the Iranian community take place, but also in its region, but we're not here to talk about the entire region. It's a conversation that concerns the West. That's not something that concerns, you know, uh, Iranian. Yes, if, yet if you look at the, the Western, the, the beauty, if you look at my slip, but the beauty standard in our Jame, eh, they're very Western centric, right? Let's get the, 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 the softest, um, I mean, the, anyone please unmute yourselves and take part in this because I think we've all heard different versions and very harmful of uh, Western white centric uh, beauty criteria within our community with the obsession of operating our noses and looking very white. And of course, we've also heard within the diaspora, you know, folks complaining about it. Because you be far away. <laughs> That's the yes, I mean, um, we clearly have that because um, in the southern parts of Iran, um, when people try to get married, it's like it's still um, not common for a whiter folks to marry um, black people. And um, when my parents wanted to get married, they couldn't do it for like 10 years uh, because my mother uh, was from a whiter family and my father was black. So um, they had they had like conflicts and they were like, no, um, which means um, we will not let our daughter marry this guy. And it's still like that today, like um, people bleach their skin with um, heavy chemicals just to look lighter or use filters because everyone is like, if you're whiter, then you're prettier. Darihan, and that's, that's it's really toxic. Are, fair is beautiful and all these very toxic and harmful, um, you know, society behaviors that are not just um, uh, uh, true to our community, but unfortunately, a reality that concerns many, many societies uh, around the world. And that's what truly the collective is about, is to say these words, and this is a visual representation of some of the work that uh, we have been doing at the collective, where we also use, you know, fabric, you see the, the the Iranian carpet on the floor, you see the Ankara fabric, you see the Western African bubu, which is uh, an African garment where in, in mainly Western African countries, you see the rusaris and everyone um, uh, in these photos are standing at this intersection. We also have Nadir standing with his mother, his father being Jamaican and being wrapped with uh, the, the uh, Ankara fabric, which in and in itself is not uh, African fabric, that would be another uh, panel, but is representative of what Africa, African fabric uh, looks like um, 
uh, and you know, it's it's uh, it's wanting to 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 shift the, those narratives. Pardis, hi, Cassie. We're on the last slide, so yes. whoever wants to jump in. Absolutely, you know, and and as much as everything that we've talked about today is so important in um, highlighting, you know, how people are looking at blackness or talking about blackness or thinking about blackness, it's also important for us to celebrate, to really just show the beauty, to show the happiness, to show the positives, and not um, always focus on the injustices and the inequality and the um, you know racism that we may face in the Iranian community. So. Uh, we're always trying to find different ways to write ourselves, to see ourselves, and um, to really be the culture and not just um, something that's to the side of the culture. We want everyone in the community to really just appreciate that Black is beautiful, Black is here, see us, boss. And we have beautiful photographs um, by Hena Koskinen, as well as here we have some more art pieces produced by the collective of Saha John. This piece is called Muhaye Zibot. Um, and uh, this is a scene, um, you know, that uh, a lot of us have been in when our mother are doing our hair. It doesn't necessarily always happen in this beautiful way. So that's why we wanted to represent it in this beautiful way for the world to see the harmonious um, possibility of standing um, at this intersection. Alex, Michoy, or Pardis, the exhibit. <laughs> yeah, and we had... Um... In September of 2021, our first uh, in-person event through the collective, we had uh, showcased some of our art at uh, 12 Gates Gallery in Philadelphia. And it was a wonderful turnout, you know, in the midst of a pandemic to have everybody come out and just see the work that we've uh, been producing in collaboration with all these wonderful artists in real life, you know. So these photos are from the event. Um, and it was really, uh, I can't put into words the, the, uh, also, the we feeling. Also got, <laughs> and we also got the, I mean, a, a lot of the stories that you saw were projected on the monitor. I didn't get to be there because I live in Freetown. And a lot of us didn't get to be there, but it shows the diasporic nature of our identities. We brought art from Bandara Bus for the first time. I mean, you know, folks uh, from the community um, have never seen uh, you know, different types of women wear and different ways of looking Iranian. Um, yeah, it's even from afar from where I was, it was a beautiful experience. I'm sure for Pego too and for those who are not able to, to be here, but you know, this is who we are and the importance of saying see us. We hope that for all of you joining tonight, if you're joining because you felt the urgent need to say it, that that need has been fulfilled and will continue to be sustained. But if you were not so convinced, we hope that now you see just by seeing faces like mine, you know, like Alex's Pazis and Pego, um, the importance of um, centering blackness in our community and saying, see us, you bust, black is beautiful. Thank you, everyone. Amazing, amazing. What a fantastic uh, display. I don't really want it to end. I've got into this, um, you know, lull of your voices. Um, it just, it's really sort of sent me trying to recollect so many anecdotes and things from my mother's family, particularly because, you know, my mom is 94 and but her father was worked for Iranian customs and excise, uh, you know, Gumruk, Edare Gumruk. And therefore they were forever dotted around the country. So this is, you know, this is we're talking over, well over a hundred years ago, uh, when she was a sort of little girl or an adolescent, when they got down to the Persian Gulf Coast and they would be either in Bandar Lenge or Boucher, et cetera. And um, I was just thinking, wondering whether there was a time when, you know, the horrendous story of um, slave trade and the uh, idea that, you know, this was a sign of you having made it if you had uh, uh, black slaves. And this is sort of starting early Qajar, probably predominantly. And then the abolition. And then I wonder if there was a lull, say, in my mother's generation 
where it, they didn't see if they were exposed to it because she had lived she'd spent maybe i don't know four or five years there and she has such fond memories the clothes she has some cloth that i've now you know inherited she learned the music that she was allowed you know it was it was a very traditional it was a very Muslim uh, environment, um, predominantly Sunni probably, but they were little girls, they could make things, they could dance, and um, so that was fine for her, and of course then they moved to, you know, borders of Afghanistan and, you know, the, you know, West Iran, Kurdistan, and I wondered if then something went wrong, and then we forgot about this absolute multicolored patchwork that it is Iran, that it is, you know, so much of West Asia, South Asia, maybe less so Central Asia. And I wouldn't, I had before I turn to so many questions that we have, do you feel that the, I'm not talking about the young generation in, in Iran, although I'm very interested to hear it from Pega outside, do you feel that your own generation of Iranians, and I don't mean the parents' generation, your age group, have come round again to understand that you know this is your zibos and if, you know baluchi zibos kurd zibos you know um and it, it or, or not because i do have some horror stories of racism that is not in the, there's no awareness of it this utter ignorance of people who've come so much worse in parts of Central Asia um, that is, is, is unbelievable that you think that such ignorance before it even becomes an abhorrent racism exists. Is it, do you find your, you know, Alex or Priscilla or uh, Gelare or Pardis or, uh, you know, is it, is it less so amongst your age group or no? They've just learned to Mm, I, I, I would say, it. I, I would say no. Um, I would say that uh, that's why Siozibost is so important because mm -hmm. it's still happening in younger children's cases. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have a seven-year-old and I have twins who are five. And uh, one of the reasons I don't take them to Iran is because I don't want them to yeah. experience a lot of the anti-blackness. I still experience when I go mm -hmm. to this day from people, random people in the streets, at the supermarket, anywhere. And um, it's, it's, yeah, the, the thing with my generation or perhaps younger generation is the possibility of a conversation. Mm -hmm. But there is still a need for a conversation oh, oh, because absolutely. it never took place. Yes. By all and, the they never that, so there is still yeah. a need that's. Yeah, and, and to see that, you know, I was astonished that when there was this, uh, you know, the George Floyd uh, story, that Iranian media jumped at it. And it was the front page and on the news, but it really was to say this, you know, the, getting at the US and to say that, look, and this is, and we're suffering the sanctions and let, let, look what else they're capable of. But this never percolated down to, can we just pause and look at our own um, black communities? And Iran translates books. I mean, there are so many um, books of obviously, you know, Maya Angelou is absolutely on top there. And there was um, another book I was trying to find. Where is it? Is it um, Amir? Um, he's passed away now, the American poet, and Amir Bak. Um, uh, I'll, I'll find the book. All this is translated. Uh -huh. But yeah, exactly. Absolutely. And it is Amir, yes, and this is, uh, but it's almost it's as if it's another world that, you know, it's, it's very uh, much, you know, we're with it. We translate all this book and we celebrate and we mark various birthdays, but somehow it's still another story and well, our it's... own community. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. no, that, That's what I was going to say in my experience, it seems like the younger generations are more willing and open and, and ready to maybe have the conversation. But um, when it comes to Iranianness, when it comes to being yeah. Persian, you know, mm -hmm. blackness is something that just is not associated with, you know, mm -hmm. um, even even within the younger generations, which is why the conversations are so important. Mm -hmm. 
which is very so anyway i'll ask it i'm just going to look through the many questions we have but i'll ask um Ida john if you would like to add something while i scour through yeah. the many so first questions. of all i have to say thank you so much i mean for me it's been eye-opening we have um as in like washirazi the iranians in uh, in zanzibar but they're very central in 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 in, in everything that, that, that's that's done so for example the revolutionary party that sort of like liberated zanzibar is the afro shirazi party oh, yeah. mm -hmm. exactly so i mean go we on know at the collective we are aware of that at the collective we're ready to bring this knowledge to our community who's probably hearing yeah. this for the first time i mean completely i mean they, they, they were very very central and um so then to talk to, to hear this to hear the the theme of of colorism from from that angle and and the erasure of of, of blackness that's that's happening it's really surprising you have opened my eyes to a whole other world and um i think you i mean one of the things you should do and you must do is you must come to zanzibar to kizim kazi it's like one of the oldest sort of like mosques and everything that's built by the shirazi and these are the black iranians um so i think yeah i mean it's really important you do that i just had to say that I, I, i'm happy that you know about all that already i love the map that um sort of like had zanzibar and india uh, yes. was just <laughs> fantastic i mean that's exactly. really centering sort of like what's what's important i'm happy that you have a voice and i'm hope, happy that you're being heard and i think yes. this is very very important so thank you very much um exactly. really asante ni sana um mm -hmm. there are so, so the, we're looking at so we have many many grateful thanks and a they found it you know visually so amazing the artwork that's gone in there the presentations um and that i mean i'm sure you can all see it, uh, the chat through and you know final one is amen black is beautiful the rock and zibos and um uh, uh, uh some uh question is so one asks that you know what is your take on haji firuz so while I'll scour through the others, so I, I let whoever would like to answer that. I don't know if Ida or if our non-Iranian um, audience are aware of what Haji Firuz is. So if you wouldn't mind just briefly explaining what it is. And uh, the questioner asks that, what do you take on that? Who is going to do it? I mean, anyone could be a part of this Pigo, Priscilla, Alex, whoever. Peter, uh, I think I think it's a very racist tradition. It's rooted in a violent history. Um, I think that you know, as the Iran an Iranian community, we have a hard time with the idea of you know we double down on things that are wrong sometimes. And I think there hasn't been much discourse about it until we have come and uh, shed light on the origins of it. Mm -hmm. And you know, you, it, you can attribute it to a lot of ignorance, but now there's a conversation about it. Now there's historical you know, um, facts behind you know, where this tradition comes from. And Frankly, as black people, I'm kind of tired of talking about blackface. <laughs> um, and it's just one of those things I think we need to just, we can reinvent how we celebrate Nowruz. You know, we can re, there's other traditions and that- You heard, you heard we heard Pegas, a celebration of, of Nowruz, um, which yeah. was the, one of the voices from home we shared, Pegajan, and not everybody in the Iranian community does blackface Haji Firuz. And by the way, just to give a little bit of context, and I know Pegaw, you want to then jump in and say yeah. something, but perhaps just to explain to the audience who doesn't know, um, you know, Alex, what, what, who and what, what this is about. Um, I mean, I'm assuming not everybody is Iranian. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, we have no rules, um, not just in Iran, but also in Tanzania and yeah. other parts uh, of the region. Um, of the region and it's uh, March 21st for Iran and different dates for different parts of the world. So that's number one. Nowruz is not celebrated only by Iranians. 
So that question doesn't only concern Iranians. If no, it's not the only... Druids do, so the Druids in Stonehenge and, do. It's and, the vernal yeah. equinox and the is Ver when the earth goes through vernal equinox. The version, celebrated, the, the version celebrated by many Iranians, not all, but by many, includes um, Haji Firuz, which is a character who dons a black face and dresses uh, uh, red with a tambourine and dances and chants for his master um, uh, that he refers to, oh, my master, what can I do? And he he dances and he chants and it's, it's a white character. It's a white person, non-black person that puts black face for it, uh, um, a color on his face and, and calm and dances. You know, I think um, uh, for me personally, the, the question is not on the origins of Haji Firuz, but it's on the harm that black face performances uh, uh, can cause and does cause to black folks, not just in Iran, but all over the world. So for me as a, as a person, as a human being, if somebody comes to me and says, black face performances, which is the act of putting black uh, uh, makeup on your face when you're not black, of speaking a certain way and talking to the master, um, uh, you know, folks, black folks will be offended. And of that's where my tradition stops. If, if I'm harmful to anyone, um, you know, I, I reconsider. And in that case, I'm harmful to myself for standing at the intersection. So I won't be uh, doing blackface Haji Firuz with my children on the 21st. No, no. Uh, that's uh, true. Uh, Idajan, you, you tell me if I'm uh, not being very good at this, there um, I wanted to, to, to say Oh, yeah. Something. Oh, of course. I'm sorry. Pigo, John, the family. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I just want to say a little something um, that we in um, southern parts of Iran, we didn't we, and don't associate Nose with um, Haji Fuse. And the first time um, I ever came across this character was um, when we had and uh, we had this homework to do for um, the, during the holidays. And it was the little notebook and it had pictures of um, how people celebrate Nowruz. And there was Haji Fuse in that. And there was like this poem that he sings. And um, I asked my mom about this character and I was like, can you explain this to me? Like, who is this? I don't know him. Um, so yeah, my mom said that it, it's a character, it sings in the streets, you've probably seen it when you were younger, when we were traveling in Iran, and she sang the poem for me, and um, as soon as I heard my master, like, I was like, um, I don't feel good about this, and I was like seven, um, so yeah, it, it felt like, um, it, it felt like, I was saying those words kind of and it was the time when um, all of my classmates at school um, they kept telling me that well you look like Africans we don't want to talk to you and I felt this I felt this massive hatred towards black people and I was like okay mom I'm seven why should I be scared of people like calling me black and then there's this character okay he's scary um yeah but i don't um I, up until today i don't associate no who's with how do you feel and, internally and, and that's so important it's so important because in america in the diaspora we are constantly asked about how do you mm -hmm. and it's by a certain portion of uh, the iranian community that perhaps really enjoys um, that particular aspect of our presentation, but it doesn't reflect the diversity of our country so the question in itself is exclusionary yeah, for that. There are lots of links that I'm sure later on we'll save all of these links. Uh, um, uh, for them, there, there are lots of links to uh, sort of Black Lives Matters uh, uh, demonstrations in the Arab world. Uh, there is uh, someone that wonderfully put a link about uh, Dennis Walker, the first Black person who played for Manchester United, their football team. His father was Iranian and of uh, uh, African origin. So I, I didn't know that. I didn't know that it's who was that. So there's a link there. Um, there are a couple of Iranians who've said that they're you know, rather taken aback having grown up in uh, Tehran, never thinking that you know, this community was Nejat Taras, was a racist community. And now they think that it's so important what you do to, to educate, to really, um, um, uh, you know, tell people and someone um, uh, uh, the, the questions about, uh, you, you know, we can answer them separately about links that are requested, people who'd like to do uh, research on this. Um, 
and they say an incredible collection of material, language as resistance is a powerful affirmation. On an intersectional narrative, we hold many identities that should be acknowledged and embraced as old Lord referenced Afro-Germans. I've learned so much. My heritage is Indo-Caribbean, so can relate to the themes around colorism. Uh, and uh, another uh, responder, endless thank yous, endless thank yous, saying this has been such an amazing eye-opener. Um, and they, uh, someone has referenced this to, you know, when you read about the Ottoman um, history, that this resonates with this uh, participant, this member of audience who looks at the more, you know, Anatolia history. And someone wonders whether this obsession with the Aryan origin of Iranians, which always makes me laugh, <laughs> that she's able to just stand in front of the mirror, whatever the ideal of an Aryan panacea is, you know, it doesn't quite fit with Iranians. But they say, is this um, this preoccupation uh, that has perhaps been uh, fed by the nationalism that comes through the poetry, whether that could be held. Um, and there are various, um, I, I'm just trying to see if uh, exactly the same thing happens in Istanbul and with the same words, siyah and sometimes qara, which is the Turkic for uh, black. I don't know, either John, anything that no, catches your yes, eye? Very, very quickly, I was going to say, like, um, I think it was uh, okay, Pardis who said that there's a representation of black Iranians is almost exclusively sort of from through the lens of, of the non-black. So the, the uh, I mean, can you just tell us a bit more about that? So um, just to hear a bit more of that, if you don't mind. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yes, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, you know, if you were to search Black Iranian before our collective on Google, um, there are a certain amount of things that would have come up none of which uh, not only were not written or produced by Black or Afro-Iranians, but don't have any input from them whatsoever. Um, it's something that made me feel, obviously growing up in Salt Lake City, uh, you know, not a part of, you know, fully a part of a Persian community. It made me feel very disconnected, right? I think, Chinwa um, Chebe, we have the quote um, about uh, telling our stories, telling our own stories, because if we don't, um, it will be told by others and it will be told incorrectly. And those in, uh, inconsistencies in what our story actually is and what is being told are the things that are gonna further perpetuate the misconceptions or um, you know, disparaging comments towards black people in general. And, and there's, also been, there's also been writings, um, as Patty's had mentioned earlier when, when talking about the, the collective, but just about the black Iranian literature but not uh, when penned by non-Black Iranians, it, it, like the work of Simin Danishvat, for example, um, that some Iranians perhaps attending have read. Um, she, Simin Danishvat, who's an Iranian novelist, considered feminist and so forth, when she pens the story of Black women, she doesn't give us any agency, you know? And I don't need to get a PhD in literature. I read the book and I'm a Black Iranian woman. Um, I'm referred to a Black maid, uh, in I think it's in a sort of I can't remember which book where uh, at some points the black woman in the story doesn't even have a name. The entire book, the uh, whether it's in the Farsi language or in this translation, is referred to as a conies or a black maid. Um, and just a, 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 you know I can't remember exactly the Persian word that she uses, but just no agency, no narrative, no points of view, no uh, as if we were this one. As women, as Iranian women, we were this one big block of one person right not differences <laughs> no. you're um, microphone whatever you said thank you go on pega go on is that pega like i i, I didn't hear um, yes pega. we didn't hear it pega john say it again um yeah I, I just wanted to confirm whatever um priscilla said they were just so on point that's true. I wonder, I think maybe Muni Ravani Pur has moved on a little bit because I think she maybe because she is southern herself. 
um, bit more, uh, but it's very true. A, a person who has really put his photographs on the map and looking at it from, I think, uh, not even so much, um, uh, you know, depictions in film anthropological um, uh, perspective is um, Pedro Mkhosro Nejad. I don't know if uh, you've looked at it. He's done a lot of Yes, we have, we have, and I think in the same lane of uh, what Pardis was saying is that yeah. it's all pinned by non-Black folks. Exactly, no, no, I was just saying, but it's, maybe- it's more, I mean, more examples confirming towards this direction no, of absolutely. more showing photos of Black folks. That's right, but I think Khosra, who, uh, Pedro, rather, who is moved to um, uh, United States now, was that one of the things he was saying that it would would this encourage? Can we have um, a you know like what you have done? So this conversation goes back many years ago when Pedro was at Oxford and then St Andrews. That it was that you know why it, you know we want to encourage you know the voices from the communities to be heard and stories that we um, narrate the stories of. Uh, the black presence in the Rajar's life, for example, but how about the descendants who might take the stage, which is what you have done, but this conversation is much older. Um, the there's, other... uh, uh, there's just one question before, I know there's like time is going, there's <laughs> Is it Mahrunush? I'm really saying that wrong completely. Mehrnush, yeah. Mehrnush. She's, <laughs> um, she's asking about marriage. So she says, you've talked about her colorism is still very much a social prejudice within Iran. So marriage is discouraged between black Iranians and lighter skinned Iranians. Are you also finding systemic racism, for example, black Iranians within uh, the education, employment, housing, entertainment, other fields? I think uh, so even marriage is still a problem. Yes, please. Um. All great questions. At the collective, we really focus on social, like, you know, the, we, we find anti-Black experiences wherever there are people. You know, I think that's what we need to take away. When you have people, you have the potential of having an anti-Black experience. And I think we have to stop pretending that if you go to one part of the world, magically, all the biases are <laughs> we're eating yes. and that makes us non anti-black no and it's everywhere it's it's whether you know it doesn't matter where you are just like anywhere else in in the world it can be and i think it's even more so in our community because of this absence and because of this erasure and all these uh, beliefs that as a result have been fabricated and are extremely harmful, which as it's because you were in the sun. There's no such thing as being black Iranian. There's no such thing as, and you know, you mentioned the work of, of uh, Pedro earlier and his oh. book, and I think it lacked context. Yeah. Having a book that just have photographs of African folks who were enslaved without any context is also yeah. damaging when you're yeah. black and Iranian yeah. and you're looking at all these photos and you don't know why all these photos of units, you know, are you being... Know but the backlash, that, even that's something why, like you know, that. We stepped in. That's why we stepped in as a collective. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. There is a need now to, to, to lead on these conversations in ways that are not harmful. It's truly the only standard we're trying to bring in the community. No, no, I, I couldn't agree. Until we... uh, uh, but it, it was, uh, I don't want to speak for him, but the, uh, uh, I think he's in Oklahoma now. I'm not quite sure. It was the the sort of saying, how could you publish things? I mean, it was. I mean, even such as the, the fact that the denial that there is this quite a big uh, sense that no Iranians were certainly not racist, and that is. Um, I can't. I mean, I'm sure you will see it. I'll copy this and send it to you. Or there are so many wonderful comments about how wonderful this has been. Um, it is, uh, you know, it's everyone who is leaving a message, just like others, I want to thank you very much for such a wonderful and informative session. I don't think it does, and I've left any, I'm not going to read through all these reams yeah. of um, yeah. And I think we have one thanks. minute to go. So maybe, yeah. maybe we could probably ask um, you guys to, 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 to give the final sort of like statement word uh, before we, we go, but for, I mean, it has been 
one of the most exciting events I've been to since 2022. For us too. And uh, I've you. just absolutely loved it. Thank you so much. Just, Please yeah. give us the, the last word before we, <laughs> we, we go. I think it will be, be great. See you as the boss. By the boss, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. It, 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 it has been amazing. And I think, you know, um, doing so much more of this, and actually, you know, I really want this to go on our Center for Iranian Studies website and really to start this conversation and with Iranian diaspora of whatever age group they are. And it is, uh, you know, such a beautiful website as well. And I think we would love to have more and more and more. I wanted to ask something very quickly. What do you think of Saeed Shambezadeh? Um, it, is that, a, it, it was you, you know, for that, so that's a... <laughs> musician, yes, he's a great musician. Oh, yes, a great musician for that thing. Okay, well, well I think perhaps uh, through music and art, certainly that will open... Uh, many more doors. Um, fantastic. Well, I, I don't know. Um, Angelique John, do you want to do the say the final word? I mean, I could just quickly run Gellore John, Alex John, Pigo John, Paradis John, Sarah John, Vito John, Priscilla John, absolutely. The head. I hope I haven't left anyone and really been a very, very, I will be watching this again, the recording. I want to pause and think and reflect on all the things you've said. Um, and we'll get all my students to definitely click on this. But um, Angelica, would you like to say? Yeah, just to add the time, big thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a fantastic event, as everybody has said. And uh, so, yes, yeah, so hope to more events like this very soon. Angelica, so I just wanted to say thank you so much because uh, you've done, you've noticed us, you brought us here. Mm -hmm. and. You know, sometimes we're noticed by those outside of the community and it makes a difference that yeah. you can bring us there. So really, truly grateful for SOAS and for bringing our voices, you know, with, to the center of Iranian diaspora and, or I'm not, you know, to all the different, um, uh, yeah, organizations and spaces that exist. Absolutely. We Thank all you. want to see your Zibos. <laughs> it is beautiful. And your website, Zbos, and, and your Instagram. I've been a follower of your Instagram for a while now. A, a, a very, very well and please done. Please support, you know, we're all self-funded. We all have our own jobs on top of being moms, women, men, whatever mm -hmm. we are. So if you want to show support, share our word, follow us on our socials, okay. make a donation, support voices that you've never heard. Absolutely. 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 Yes. Well, we'll certainly put all the links on our yeah. respective uh, web pages and encourages and promote it. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's really been. Anyway, thank you so much. It has mm -hmm. been fantastic. So mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you very much to all the attendees as well. Thank you for joining mm -hmm. us and uh, keep following us. And we'll see you very soon.